to talk about his work. Um, Eric earned his BA from the University of Illinois in Chicago and his MA and MFA from the University of Iowa. And he recently retired from Middlebury College after 33 years of teaching sculpture and drawing. Um, his work has been featured in both group shows and one person shows around the country. And it's been installed in public sculpture parks um, in a number of places, including James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia, Navy Pier in Chicago, and the DeCorva Museum and Sculpture Park in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Um, he has served as a visiting artist at a number of, of sites, including the Edinburgh College of Art in Scotland, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and the Vermont Studio Center in Johnson. Um, he's also received fellowships and awards from a number of places um, in Europe as well as in the States. So we are really thrilled to um, have the opportunity to exhibit his work, uh, 365, in the uh, kind of prime spot in the East Gallery as part of ingrain contemporary work in wood. Um, so please join me in welcoming Eric Nelson. <laughs> I'm going to navigate this. And best not to wander when you're talking. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. So if I, actually, if you could move up and I start careening around, you can catch me <laughs> when I go. Um, well, thank you all for coming out. I'm going to uh, offer some um, brief comments about earlier work, um, kind of going over the whole of my career with just a few pieces. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about the project at hand. And then we will break from here and go into the gallery and do a Q&A or whatever you'd like to do at that point. Um, and I want to, uh, before I begin, thank you and your staff. So Janie Cohen and, um, Christi and, and, oh, and Margaret, who is not, oh, there you are, Margaret. <laughs> yes, and here's Christina, and Jeff's not here, and Lisa. You guys are great. You really made it uh, easy for me to do this. And, uh, the results, I think, are, speak for themselves. It was really good. So thank you very much for that. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, flip through some slides, and I have some comments that I can look at here that I'll be looking at and reading from. And um, if you have questions along the way, just fire them up. This is a small, intimate crowd. And um, as I said, we won't be here that long, so that those of you who might be worried about this rain changing to snow, we'll get you home before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, for me, uh, sculpture exists in the present. Even if what I'm looking at was made centuries ago, I'm engaged by what's in my space at the moment of viewing. Viewing sculpture is unlike viewing 2D art. It has a unique physical presence. I'm not reconstructing objects from an illusion um, as you are when you're looking at a painting in most instances. Um, and I'm keenly interested in the properties of sculpture, things like form, material, color, tactility, weight, gesture, balance, and uh, the physical experience required in moving around them. This has like, always been a big deal for me, even before I realized it was in my early years. Um, and I, in the modern era, minimalists and formalists, people like Carl Andre and Anthony Caro have brought more of these properties to bear on the experience of viewing sculpture, and I think you'll see that in some of my work, those influences or those properties, certainly. I simply like objects. Most everyone plays with or handles objects, especially when they're young. Um, I've always been fascinated by how objects are made, what they're made of, and how they take their place in space. My sculpture derives uh, mostly from my observations and experiences in the world, including, in some cases, references to literary cultural or art historical themes. For me, making sculpture is more an act of faith than of knowledge and understanding. 
I have more faith in doing than in overwrought consideration. I will speak about my previous work, as I just said, and then um, we'll talk about the work that's uh, the 365 project. So um, one of the first sculptures on the left, when I started taking my seri myself seriously as a sculptor, um, is there. It's a, 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 a rod and uh, planar steel construction. It's about eight and a half feet tall. And um, on the right, you see me um, at the uh, uh, Burlington Railroad Scrapyard in, in Eola, Illinois, near Chicago, uh, where I lived. And uh, that was when I first started working with, with metal. I was a torch operator. And uh, we cut apart um, boxcars and gondolas and, and even some steam locomotives. It was that long ago. <laughs> that <we> just <laughs> uh, And the same sculpture on the left and a Picasso sculpture, the so-called Lady of the Loop in the Civic Center in downtown Chicago. This is just a few blocks from where I studied. And, um, you know, I, when I was making sculpture, I didn't think I was influenced by anything. By, <laughs> I thought I was making this stuff up and it was all just completely original, but um, of course I was influenced by this. And the word original, it, you know, it sort of suggests that there are origins in things that we understand and, and, and somehow take over and transform in our own way as we go along. Um, but anyway, um, I was interested in producing 3D form from 2D line and plane. I was also interested in dynamic balance and equilibrium. And I think you see that actually in both sculptures, but maybe mo more so in mine than the Picasso. <laughs> um, on the left is a a steel uh, piece. The plates are three and a half feet square, and there are rods running through them. Um, and uh, the piece on the right is a Richard Serra uh, sculpture called One Ton Prop. The Serra piece is uh, four foot square slabs of lead that are one inch thick. Each one weighs 500 pounds. So you can do the math. It's one ton of stuff that's held together by uh, simply by gravity and by um, uh, a little bit of friction. They're leaning into one another at the corners, as you can see. Uh, my piece on the right is held together by gravity and friction as well. Those plates are, are uh, uh, elevated and supported, and then I run these rods through them, and then I take the supports away. And I think you can see the configuration of the plates. Uh, they sort of torque and squeeze and hold themselves in position with those rods in place. But if you pick up the sculpture, it's just going to collapse and slide away. Mm -hmm. So it's all dependent on those kinds of forces and on, on being able to sit on a ground plane. So here's a larger version of that same concept in cement on the left. Um, this is on the campus of the University of Iowa, where I did graduate work. I think it's still there. It's sinking into the earth, <laughs> <laughs> but it's still there. It's a very heavy sculpture uh, put together in the same way. And the piece on the right is, a rich, is another Richard Serra piece that involves a plate of steel that's uh, four and a half feet square and an inch thick, and there's a solid steel cylinder on the back corner of it. And if you look, it's a white slide, obviously, but the floor is painted white as well, but you can see the floorboards there. But the sculpture, the, the plate is held up by the, by the solid steel cylinder. The solid steel cylinder is held, held up by the corner of the wall, and the cylinder itself is right on the back corner of that plate. So it would like to maybe scoot it forward, but there's enough weight and friction to keep that all sort of in equilibrium. Very exciting stuff to me. <laughs> Uh, these are some cement discs that I made that were in my backyard in Middlebury that um, the bottoms of the sculpture of those discs are the same as the tops and I place them in different configurations and, and they find their own kind of level. I set them up in an arc here but they sort of tip and lean the way they will um, according to the terrain or according to where there's a little more mass in one part of the sculpture than another. Um, I liked working with cement. It's a common material, and, a, and not one you often think about as a, as a material for art, uh, certainly not in a traditional or classical sense. Uh, but I continued with this material, and in a piece on the left, I actually cast my studio radio in there, and it was uh, tuned to 91.7, which is the Middlebury College radio station, and it still works. And it, <laughs> And you could drive around the country until you come into that frequency and it, you know. So if a collector bought it, there would be a way that you could maybe use it. <laughs> or you'd have to decide where you wanted to live in relation to that. 
And the piece on the right is a light bulb that's embedded in a column of solid cement. So the light ray, if you will, is kind of being, being trapped. Um, I'm just interested in trapping sound and, and light uh, in this process. And uh, in another cement piece in wood, um, this is about nine feet tall, and it involves a, a sort of capturing, if you will, um, negative space in this kind of minimalist column and then these sort of slightly antiquarian uh, lathe turn posts. But uh, those posts, there's four of them, you can only see two because I shot it straight on. Uh, those posts support uh, um, the block above there and that space inside of there I think is pretty charged when you get near this thing. If you just learn to look at and understand weight. <laughs> Um, these are some uh, uh, pieces that I did in, in um, Iowa that involve um, the use of planks and um, continuing my interest in, um, in geometry and in gravity and tension as means of, of support or um, uh, presenting, um, not really objects, but these kind of installations or situations. The piece on the left is, a, is simply just one plank that's held in place by the rope that you see that's um, uh, going through an eyelet on the floor around the beam and on the eyelet on the top of the wall there, and it's just all sort of held in tension. The piece on the right is an 18-foot bridge timber that's held in place by as many as it took to balance it out over that ledge. So I just kept stacking until it was there. And, and so I think those pieces somehow speak for themselves in terms of how they're made and how they're constructed and how they can be in the world. The piece on the left is a rod and uh, is a, a plate and uh, timber piece. Those are 18 foot timbers, they don't look like it, that are uh, wedged uh, on, uh, and held in place by the weight of the steel plates and the friction on the surface that they're sitting on. And then I got a little too intimate with Euclidean geometry. I can still feel the weight of that timber on my head today. <laughs> More pieces that were based on my interest in, in, in geometry and these other properties of, of gravity and, and balance and tension. That's a parallelogram sort of frame on the left and the little weights you see in the air are uh, attached to strings that are supporting that steel rod that's a kind of a quarter of an arc there. It's just sort of, um, there's an actual kind of equilibrium there. I don't know if you can visually sense it, but there is. And the piece on the right is a, a, a frame. The L of the uh, yellow wood frame is about six feet high, so you can pass under that. And the arc on the left is held in tension by the cord that you see. And the, uh, it's, it's sort of barely kind of holding itself together in space. Um, very edgy. I started uh, to return to the use of steel from my earlier days. And, um, Sculpture on the left is, a, is an abstract sort of semi-figural sculpture that has a cap on the top. Sometimes the, it's often an issue in sculpture, like what are you going to do at the top of this thing? Does it come to a point, you know, or do you lop the head off, you know? Actually, the ancient Greeks didn't do that, but those who followed did, and they seemed to be more interesting when you did that. There's always the problem with the head, but that was sort of my wrestling with that in that piece. And then uh, I have a sort of more horizontal kind of ground-hugging piece on the right from early Vermont days. When I say early Vermont days, that means late 70s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These are some more metal pieces that are uh, made of painted steel, and in the case of the one on the left, um, cement um, is added for this foot element. Um, the titles, uh, most of my work is untitled up to this point in time. I started titling work. Shall We is the is the title of the piece on the left a kind of invitation to interact or to dance, if you will, even as clumsy as it might be with that foot? <laughs> and then, If You Please is a, um, the title of the one on the right, and it's a painted steel and forged steel uh, construction that, um, um, in both instances, these are sort of chair-like structures, and they're made to be the size of a figure, and I think that there's a really strong kind of body-to-object uh, uh, tug on these pieces when you're in their space. And this piece is um, called A Father Fears for His Daughter. <laughs> I don't know why I'm getting emotional. My daughter's recently married, and now she's going to have a, our first grandchild. But anyway, um, I made this piece when she was born. And I was just thinking about kind of all of the uh, uh, energy, dance, movement, 
um, sex, male and female uh, parts are being represented in this piece, all of the kinds of things that she was going to encounter that are sort of condensed into this one object. It's about five feet high. It's made of, s of steel that's been painted. And those are all kind of hollow volumes. They're not planar. So I don't know if you can tell that from the slide, but they're sort of hollow, skinny volumes. Um, I'll just, another steel piece. The fabrication technique is sort of revealed or allowed to remain at the end of it. This piece is called yawn. I started using verbs um, to describe these pieces, just a single verb. So that's yawn. Um, submerge is the piece on the left. And um, I'll show you a few more down the road. Uh, I, I make drawings for most of my sculptures so that I can, they're not engineering plans, but I want to have a sense of what I'm trying to do. And then I sort of get a hold of the material and, and it, it often changes or shifts from the drawings. They're not precise drawings. This one is a little more precise looking than most of my other drawings are. But the piece on the left uh, shows the evidence of pulling curved plates together and sort of readjusting it to get, to get it where I wanted it. And I just allow that um, process to remain in view with the final piece. Then um, I began a series of more organically um, formed um, and um, uh, uh, steel, uh, welded steel objects. And these are, uh, I'll show you uh, maybe a half a dozen of these fairly quickly, but these are pieces that are made uh, from plates of steel that I get from a scrapyard. Um, not so much for the expense, but that's, that is a factor, but I, I, I like the previously used material. There's paint on it, there's uh, rust, there's pitting, so there's a kind of an interesting texture to it. And then these are from a scrapyard, they're being processed um, by um, these giant shears that go around scrapyards and pick up stuff and snip it, and, and it gets crunched and folded. So I buy a bunch of that stuff that's sort of previously banged around quite a bit and bent. And then I um, cut them and assemble them in the forms that you see with, um, I don't know how many of you do ceramics here, but uh, if you've ever done it and done slab built, you know, coil built pots, and then there are slab built pots where you just cut a chunk of clay, put slip on the edges and jam it up against another one. It's sort of that technique only with welding and I tack um, these, um, uh, plates together until I get the final form, and then I finally weld the whole thing up and so on. You'll see a, a series of uh, work in progress that um, um, will, will make that clearer. I'm going to show you uh, maybe a half a dozen slides here of influences. I was thinking of students at this talk and sort of maybe students wondering um, where artists are getting their ideas or how influences on their work sort of comes about and manifests itself in the work. So. Here's the uh, Elgin Marbles at the British Museum uh, from the east pediment of the Parthenon. Many of you have probably seen these. Um, and a close-up uh, on the right. I, uh, these are produced um, in, the, in the fifth century, and it was about the time that um, the Greeks sort of really figured out how to represent the human figure. Um, but I was struck by the sense of weight and um, balance and uh, especially in, in the detail on the right, you can see the surface texture, um, the, the drapery, I thought was just terrific. So um, I looked, again, at a lot of classical sculpture, and like Rodin, I discovered an interest in the fragment, how the fragment relates to a larger imagined whole, and how it has an energy and plastic unity that the whole may not have. So I also began to think about material how material and, and surface texture can reveal a, a substructure of sort of turbulent, active, restless volumes. And uh, Rodin sculpture um, on the left, it's a torso in the Belvedere, torso from the Vatican Museum on the right. Um, in Rodin's case, he's kind of um, reinventing and taking a look at um, uh, the, the classical uh, fragments from the Renaissance period. And um, he sort of rediscovers that sort of expressive potential of it. And the piece on the right, I don't know all of its history, maybe some of you do, but um, it was a more whole sculpture before it found its way in this form. Degas uh, dancers modeled in wax. If you look at that surface, there's a pretty good slide. You can see that texture. And these are cast in bronze. Metropolitan Museum has, they're in the canton. Cantor collection in the Metropolitan, among other places. 
I like the balance and gravity and gesture, gestural qualities. I think you can see that. Um, Rancuzzi, Torment 2, and um, Torso, both from the early 10s, 1910s, 1907, 9. Um, I liked his severe uh, analysis and expressive manipulation of form. And I also liked his um, um, use of the completeness of fragments, especially on the female torso on the right, how a portion of a larger whole can seem like a complete um, and interesting object in and of itself. And uh, I was also interested in Henry Moore's work. These are both sort of very organically uh, formed um, figural sculptures with the piece on the left, the kind of this introduction of negative space, or let's just say the space of the viewer passing through the space of the sculpture, and vice versa. I found that to be a really interesting quality. And um, Magdalena Avakanowicz on the left in a piece that um, it's simply called Back, and some of you may have seen her work, and then often um, there are um, dozens and sometimes hundreds of these things lined up and, and, and gathered in rows and so on. Um, it's made from wood and from a kind of a resin um, impregnated muslin material. The piece on the right is a Martin Purrier sculpture, a Chicago sculptor, um, whose work has always fascinated me. These are sort of seemingly familiar, but ultimately unnameable forms. Um, this is a wooden sculpture. It's about five and a half, six feet high, about my height, and it's uh, a black, a dark stained wood. And, um, I was influenced by a lot of things that I was observing in nature. And um, the, the piece on the left, uh, you can see the uh, comparison of, of these uh, bubbles and the turtle shells showing uh, surface uh, shrinkage. Uh, we have a physicist in here who could talk a little more about that. Um, and then um, I have um, a giraffe on the right. And I just was thinking about how things are joined and how pattern works out. And these are basically three and four way joints. If you look at a, at a giraffe or if you look at a, a, a dried lake bed and um, there's a natural uh, uh, occurrence there that, I, that happens in my sculpture that I wasn't even thinking about, just what it takes to sort of piece these together. So those become moments in the work and a little bit of geology and um, a record of time in these pieces, the piece on the left from Bryce Canyon, a hoodoo so-called, and a piece from Zion, one of the Zion cones. Um, I just love their form and their, and their, and their texture and the evidence of, of the passing of time that it took to get us. So we have a geologist who can talk more about that, too. We have, we have, I, have, I, have, I have all this support in the audience. That <laughs> this is a piece called Yield. So just sort of continuing with those sort of themes I just showed you I was influenced by. You'll see it in the sculpture. This is a piece called Restraint. This one is uh, painted by me several layers and then rubbed back to produce the effect and to enhance the texture of, that you see there. This one's called Differ. And there's uh, four pieces. Most of the works that you're going to be seeing are uh, life size, if you will, or the size of, of, a fig of a, an adult figure, a tall one. <laughs> These are. Um, three sculptures that I made independently and then first got the idea to push them together and present them as a group. And you're seeing that group, you're seeing them made individually and photographed individually in the, the slides on the top. And then at the De Cordoba Museum, which uh, Janie mentioned a little bit ago, is the installation that you see there. And I was really interested in um, the surface quality and the property of the material and the process sort of being uh, remaining evident. As these things stay out for a longer period of time, the oxidation is much more even, and you see less of that pattern on the surface. But I just accept that. I don't try to, there's no real coating you can put on it to hold that and have it be in the weather. These are drawings that are related to, well, certainly the one on the left to the work you just saw. They're um, watercolor and uh, both uh, transparent and opaque watercolor drawings. And um, again, I do these to try to realize the form and the volume of these forms. I kind of sort of work my way, um, in the case of the pieces on the right, from the sort of the center out and arrive at 
uh, a form or contours that seem interesting and possible to uh, produce in a sculpture. Here's a quick view of the process. That's the, all these plates are being, they're welded together in the top slide of one piece. Then I grind the seams. If, if I were to leave the welds there, they would stick up and the surface doesn't have continuity. There's a certain sense of like continuity and tactility that's just too, um, too brisk in, the, in, in, an un, in a welded, unground thing. So that's the, the day I ground them, oh, more than one day of grinding, but it's the day I pulled it out and then I, uh, I water them with a garden hose. And uh, so that's one day of watering and then a, w a week of watering. And this is in my studio at Middlebury College at the time. I'm not there anymore, but you can't, I can't tell you how many times people would see me watering these things going. <laughs> okay. It's okay. It's all right. I will press her. It's okay. Are they growing, Eric? I don't know. <laughs> Um, these, these pieces are um, in um, Providence, Rhode Island, at Biltmore Park. It's right in the center of downtown Providence, not too far from the Biltmore Hotel where uh, Mayor Cianci used to live. Do you know him? I don't want to get into this. <laughs> He's quite a character. Um, he rode down one of his wife's suitors uh, on a horse. And <laughs> you know <th> Anybody <laughs> know this? Okay. Here's some more drawings that uh, I've done for sculptures. These are a little denser, obviously. They're, again, watercolor and, and uh, transparent and opaque. And um, much denser built up. I have a sense of the volume that I can uh, get from these works. And also, um, I kind of arrive at these forms through this accretion, this process of just building this thing out. And uh, there's some charcoal drawings on the left and some very similar objects on the right. These are. Uh, wood maquettes, walnut maquettes. Uh, they're about a foot high. Mm, you can get each one of them in your hand, but I, um, the further I went with some of these large pieces, the more, um, um, not so much planning, but the more sense that I had to have of where this was going to go, uh, just because of the material and the process and the time involved. So um, I started doing maquettes, and those are kind of really rough carved uh, maquettes that have an interesting texture, you'll see in the next one. Um, this is a maquette for a piece that's called uh, Restless Morning, Noon, and Night, and you'll see that piece right here. And this is at Navy Pier in Chicago, which uh, Janie mentioned in the introduction. And that brings us to these guys, which are in the gallery here, but they're not shown this way. I like the way they're shown there. Um, these get a little bit overwhelming when you put that many of them together, but these are the first 200 of the um, 365 project that you'll see. Um, and they, um, they, yeah, I'll just read what I wrote on this because I, I kind of thought through this fairly carefully. Can you guys hear me? I just realized I wasn't in front of that mic. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> good time to ask, Eric. <laughs> anyway, I began this project with the idea that I would make one sculpture a day for a year, 365 in all. I wanted to revisit my childhood interest in toys and other small objects that had a transformative, empowering quality for me. I also wanted to make small objects in wood through carving, probably oldest process in the history of sculpture. I thought about an exhibition of Alberto Giacometti's sculpture held several years ago at MoMA. Some of you might have seen it, especially the very small objects he made in plaster during World War II when he had uh, limited space and limited resources. Um, all of the work that he did during those war years um, fit in a matchbox, okay? Little bitty plaster pieces that were modeled and then carved and scraped on. Um, in spite of their size and their formal simplicity, one looked, looked like, looked like a, simply a, a baseball bat oriented vertically, I thought they were very powerful objects, especially in the confines of the space around them in the museum presentation. I'm going to show you one right after this slide. I started the, the project with invented simple linear forms that would be on the upper left of those slides there. And um, they were based on the figure and on geometry, followed uh, by other sources from nature, ancient tools, and the history of fine and decorative art. In addition to many museum visits, I consulted the 18th and 19th century encyclopedias of Diderot, 
Heck and Haeckel. You guys know these? These are great resources. Just fascinating. Um, you will recognize many of these sources in the exhibition. At times, I felt like a jazz musician who interprets standards and uh, other artists' songs and comes up with something new or fresh within the familiar form. So I got less troubled as I got older, I guess, about acknowledging influences and, <laughs> and weaving them into the work I do. Anyway, many times during the long run of this project, I was plagued by doubt, Ooh. not knowing the way forward, often with only one or two drawings of ideas ahead of my production. The works are shown chronologically, revealing how my mind works, varying certain forms or beginning a theme and returning to it later. You'll see that out here. And uh, the works are unified by their size and their presentation in a double line out here, uh, requiring movement on the part of the viewer. In order to move the viewer, you've got to make the viewer move. Isn't that great? <laughs> I didn't. No, you <laughs> Yeah. No, I'll, I'll end with one of his, though. That wasn't his. Make the viewer move. I mean, that's always been a big part of my operation. Much of life, the biological existence of all spaces in general, and human behavior in particular, involves repetition and variation. I hope to communicate what's profound about that through this new body of work. I'm also re-engaging an old Gestalt theory, which states that the sum is greater than the total of the parts. You can agree with that or not.